I'm Ernie Humphrey, Educational Program Leader for Performative, the largest online community for corporate finance, accounting, treasury, and related professionals. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Turbocharging 2014's Growth Across the Enterprise, How Finance Leaders Drive Success. As companies gear up for growth in 2014, finance leaders face a dilemma of how to lead aggressive, aggressive growth initiatives without compromising profitability, customer relationships, and the speed and quality of execution. A lack of visibility across the enterprise impacts the ability of finance leaders to deliver on company growth initiatives that meet key strategic objectives. Today, through an interactive, interactive discussion with two senior finance leaders, we will discover how they have leveraged technology to increase visibility into key areas of their companies, including HR, sales, and marketing, and how this 2020 vision has empowered their companies to achieve sustainable business growth while improving employee productivity, all at a reasonable cost. I'd like to thank NetSuite, whose commitment to thought leadership helps us make this webinar possible and delivered at no cost. Equipped on today's agenda, first we'll experience a joint presentation and interactive discussion among our featured speakers. And then we'll move to the interactive Q&A session where we'll spend the remainder of our hour. We would like this to be an interactive experience for you, so if you have any questions at any time, please go to the questions area and you go to the webinar control panel and send us your questions. We can't promise to get all that in, but we will do our best and we'll follow up afterwards with any questions we did not get to. A few logistical notes about the webinar, links to today's presentation and video recording of the webinar we sent out to all attendees within 24 hours of the event. Those who would like CPE credits need to answer all polling questions during the event and should have pre-registered for CPE credits. For any questions on CPE credits, please send an email to cpe at performative.com. Those attendees who qualify for CPE credits will receive a certificate via email in the next 24 to 48 hours. Again, we encourage you to ask questions on today's topic via the questions box in your GoToWebinar control panel any time during the webinar. You'll be asked to take a short survey today regarding the webinar. We'd really appreciate your feedback regarding our event today, as we always strive to improve the ROI we offer our event attendees for their valuable time. A quick word about Performative. Performative is the largest online community resource for senior level corporate finance, accounting, treasury, and related leaders. Performative connects corporate finance leaders to provide instant advice and insights on the tough financial and strategic challenges they face every day. I'd like to introduce Today's three featured speakers, uh, Michael Borton. Michael currently serves as Harmony Information Systems Chief Financial Officer and is responsible for the company's finance, accounting, and administrative operations. He joined Harmony from Consul Risk Management, a leading global security company. During his time there, he successfully facilitated the sale of the company to IBM. He has held senior management positions with several international technology companies and various senior financial roles at Schlumberger. He holds a bachelor's degree from Valparaiso University, an MBA from Indiana University, as a certified management accountant. Our second speaker is Evan Makarov. Evan is the controller of SmugMug, a photo sharing and e-commerce solution for consumers and professional photographers. Prior to joining SmugMug, Evan was the Silicon, at the Silicon Valley offices of Ernst & Young and PwC, where he focused on tax planning, insurance, and compliance services for high-tech companies in the Valley. Evan graduated from Brigham Young University with a bachelor's and master's degrees in accounting. Our, our third speaker, feature speaker, is Ben Kang. Ben is a senior product manager at NetSuite and has prior work experience in both the software industry and professional services. Prior to NetSuite, he performed product marketing for Oracle, supporting software sales of corporate finance, modeling, and planning products at companies around the world. Prior to working in the software industry, he worked as a consultant at Deloitte while he earned a CPA while serving in the financial services industry. He holds an MBA from Northwestern University and a BS in business administration from the University of California, Berkeley. With that, it is my distinct pleasure to hand the floor over to Ben Kang. Ben, the floor is yours. Please take it away from us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ernie. So what I'd like to do is to spend a few moments with you to tell you about uh, who we are at NetSuite. And so what we are is a software company that was founded in 1998, and we sold accounting software delivered on the web. No one said SaaS back in 1998, and we're also going pretty quickly too. And this company, we started out serving the needs of very small companies, and over time, as the product and feature set became more sophisticated, we start to serve a lot more innovative, disruptive companies like Harmony Information Systems and SmugMug. And increasingly, as the product has gotten more functionality and feature-rich and deeper and broader, we're seeing larger enterprises use our software for some of the distributed parts of their larger businesses as of late. So, is your company prepared for growth? If you look at a title slide, it almost sounds too perfect. It sounds like that there's some kind of pre-growth staging area for you to go and set up all the pieces and get everything ready right before you go out and grow. But the reality is we're in the middle of growth and we're trying to manage growth. There really isn't a chance to pause, think, stop, and think again 
about this kind of change and this kind of growth, and then to move forward at your convenience. I know of a finance department that does a uh, three-year plan annually for the board. And when they do this, they not only think about revenues and profitability in the future, but also what will it do to the company three years from now. So given the expected size of the company with those projections, how many employees will that be? How many monthly paychecks will that be? How many expense reports? How many customers? How many professional services projects will be running? Finance looks at these metrics, the resulting processes, and the way the process is currently done. Some will stay in place and scale if, for example, we were to add just two more guys to that process. Others, on the other hand, really need to be examined from where the process is today and where it needs to be. And what's the path between the process that we have right now and the process that we're going to have to have when we're that size? And we have to think about those gaps as finance leaders. That's planning for growth and planning for scale. Meanwhile, the landscape has been changing from a roles and responsibilities perspective. According to a recent study done by the IMA, CFOs were asked to cite how their time has changed in the past three years, and what we're finding is that they are dedicating much more time to corporate strategy and to initiatives to help drive business results. Now, that's not to say that CFOs aren't already performing as strategic business partners in their companies, but really the amount of time is shifting much more significantly to these kinds of activities. And as a result of this trade-off, the amount of time that's being allocated to traditional accounting roles is going down. But the change doesn't just stop at the CFO level because when the same question was asked to controllers, we're also finding an interesting trend for the last three years. The same IMA study is indicating that the controller role, the controller role is evolving such that more time is also being spent doing more value-add activities and analysis to drive the business. And at the same time, there's this need for controllers to also drive more of the productivity improvements that are going on in their companies. You know, look for ways to share data, both financial and non-financial, to not just within finance, but all the operational areas. You know, they're becoming this facilitator, if you will, to make sure that everyone in the company who's a decision maker can have access to information so that they can be productive to help drive the business. And this increase in responsibilities for controllers, it's really been a continuing trend that we've noticed uh, from the software vendor side of things. And yet, as these responsibilities have been increasing, the existing ones around financial accounting, they're still there, and they haven't gone away, and they're not going to go away. And so in order for finance leaders to dedicate more time to these strategy-focused job requirements, it turns out that they basically have three options to consider if they're going to try and support the day-to-day -day finance activities. One, they can just work longer hours. Two, they can add resources. Or three, they can try to invest in terms of the tools and technology that they, that they think they're going to need. So why is it challenging to have reliable processes that support growth? If you think back to what's scalable, what's not scalable, you know, what are the expectations being placed on me as a finance leader, you know, why is it challenging? And what we find is that there are distractions that finance leaders are facing. The slide is talking about challenges, but I tend to think of these as distractions, and so do many of the companies who I speak with. So for example, all finance leaders know that some processes are inefficient. For example, you know the person who's doing something manually that a system really ought to do. It's inefficient, and whatever confidence you have in that process keeps diminishing as your company moves along. And how about this scenario? If you were to compare and contrast how a manual process with one person outside your office in the cube is one thing versus a manual process with a team of people on the other side of the world who you seldom see doing another thing, you know, it's these kinds of situations as finance leaders that make it hard for you and other leaders in the company to have confidence in the quality and the process of your data. And as many of us have experienced the outcomes of these manual pains, you know, you get little advanced warning of potential issues that are material to financials. You don't have good visibility into the status of your closed cycle. And it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time sometimes to even see consolidated results. And one thing that we seem to notice all the time or almost all the time is that when companies deal with the challenges of running their businesses, they end up solving point problems along the way that result in siloed data. So their business is going along, and they'll have customer data in one system. And then they'll have order data in another system. They'll have revenue data in another system, accounting data in another system, customer support data in another system. It's becoming very difficult to have a complete view of the business, not just at your home office, but for all your subsidiaries, even at a consolidated level. And all these kinds of pains, all these distractions 
they all point to a need to have some kind of unification or some unified way in a system so that you can stay current and that your company can keep it as you grow and as you evolve. But as you're likely to know already, if you don't, keeping a system current as a company grows is a very hard thing to do. So it's not surprising, but ideally, you'd like to get on one system that can handle as many processes and as much of each process as possible. You'd like to have one system that can record the sales leap at the very beginning and then track your prospects and then generate estimates and then book orders, fill those orders, track the shipping, the inventory, and then record the revenue, collect the cash, all without having to worry about manually managing the handoffs between systems or between people. It's much more efficient and easier to get the consolidated view, and you don't want to have to worry about the quality of the data falling apart in the handoffs. Another example, how about rolling up financials across distributed offices? Say you are in an organization where you have offices in California, Mexico, and London. It will be easier if all your people are using the same data and process. It should be easy to have the same process and controls in place from subsidiary to subsidiary so that you're confident as leaders knowing that your processes are working the same way across all locations. And how about metric setting? It, you, know, you should be able to have one system where it works across all subsidiaries when it comes to metric setting. The same report can be used at headquarters, and the same one can be used for the general manager with one system across location. Build it once and then share it. And then as your company evolves, stay on that one system. It doesn't help to invest significant time and resources to get on the one system and then have to acquire another company only to have a new system to deal with. These new places never get the new system. It would be ideal if you can deploy agilely enough so that you can keep up with the speed of business change. But then achieving that ideal isn't easy. There's clearly a vision in place, but why is it that we can't realize this vision all the time? Well, first of all, an implementation takes forever because it really doesn't start with an implementation. It starts at the rack, and then machines. Then you install the software, and then the security software, and then you have to buy another rack, and then another database. And then you get to the ERP software. And then there's customization. You know, customization is a chore because it takes the most time and expense from an implementation perspective. For example, for some perspective, you know, a customer once told me that they had a field in their customer records that they had to track for their data, and the system they were using didn't have it. And they were using an on-premise system, and what would happen is that a consultant would come in, then go away and come back in about two weeks to modify the data structure. But with something like NetSuite software, they were able to make that change during a meeting on the fly. On-premise systems have lots of those kinds of meetings where doing just a little bit of customization is a huge major effort. And these meetings compound and they drag down the speed of implementation. And then what happens is this layer of permanent overhead is introduced where people have to be done to manage the machines since it needs to get replaced every three years. You, know, you need to install the software patch and then the database patch and then there's some upgrade that needs to be done. Who's going to manage the integrations? Who's going to take care of the customizations? You know, there's this layer of overhead that never goes away and it can keep building. And if you think about another example, how, you know, what it would be like to have two guys who you leave behind, you know, imagine eight guys go to implement a system for a new subsidiary, six guys would leave for the next project, and then two would stay behind in order to ensure, in order to ensure that the system was up and running 24-7. And so the more you do these kinds of things, the more you build up this layer. It slows the project down as it goes on. And meanwhile, the organization doesn't stand still from you. You're growing, you're dealing with changes, but the pace of implementation, it just makes it so difficult to have that one system vision realized when you're dealing with a multi-system reality. Back when I was a finance consultant, one thing that always applied to every client of mine was that finance had to work with scarce resources. You have your budgets, you follow them, and you spend on the tools and headcount that you can afford. And that's still pretty much the case today. And when your organization experience is experiencing change due to growth, the expectations that are placed on you as finance leaders can be very overwhelming. Scarce resources, not enough time to do things, dealing with the unexpected. You know, it's, it's stressful to deal with change when it's due to growth. But if your company can get into a system that everyone uses and is able to customize as time passes, you can really position yourself to keep everyone on that same system while you as finance leaders can focus on helping your business be successful without dealing with the distractions that I mentioned earlier. And to talk about some of the things that you as finance leaders ought to consider for 2014 in terms of what you can do to drive some of these kinds of business results, yeah, I'd like to share five things with you. The first thing I'd like to share with you is to think about how you can foster collaboration 
within your organization. If you can have a system that can handle all of your core processes, not just for accounting, but for the other functions like sales, support, HR, you know, all the data that you possess is going to give you a 360 degree view of your customer. And from the CEO to the accounting staff, even to your vendors and customers, everyone will always be looking at the same information. You know, imagine the next time you go to a meeting, you won't have to ask the question anymore, gee, I wonder if my neighbor is looking at the same data that I'm looking at, because the last time they weren't the same, it was a deal stopper, and we ended up having just a two-minute meeting and couldn't go forward. Well, you know, if you think about what it would take to foster collaboration, as leaders, think about how a single system can keep everyone both inside and outside the organization to be productive while they're working together. Because when you have one system, nothing falls through the cracks. But having a system to handle your core processes doesn't actually guarantee you can keep everyone on the same system after you go live. So the second thing that as leaders you should consider for what you would want to have or need to have for 2014 and beyond is to think about you know, the need for customization at the speed of change. Because once you decide to look at a particular tool of technology, you want to think of it as an investment and as an investment that can accommodate your unique business models. And when it comes to supporting growth, oftentimes what we see is that a system is going to have to be able to be customized. So for example, if your business were to launch a new project, enter a new territory or country, or introduce a new offering like services that's, a, that's different from your existing product business, there's almost always a need to have to modify your existing processes or create new workflows. Or how about another kind of change that has to deal with accounting regulations? You know, as many of you on this call are probably aware, FASB intends to issue new guidance around revenue recognition this year. What kind of impact will these new changes have on your current revenue cycle? What's going to happen to your current processes? And how long will it take to make modifications you need? You know, whether you have to modify your reports, collect new pieces of data, or introduce new processes, you know, business and regulatory change will be inevitable. But when you have a system, like a cloud system, that can help you, you can actually work with a very efficient set of scarce resources without reinventing the wheel. Change only what needs to be changed. You don't have to endure a multi-month rollout to make the change. The third thing that I'd like to share with you is about not just collectively what can help your organizations as you move forward and look in 2014 and beyond, but what are some of the productivity gains something like cloud technology can help you realize from an individual perspective. Well, the first has to do with real-time information from just using a web browser. And what you're looking at right now is an example of a finance manager's dashboard into the KPIs of a software company who can address questions like, how's our billing efficiency? How profitable are we? You know, what's our customer retention trend? If you have a professional services business, your questions will probably be a little different. You know, imagine having real-time information to see and address questions like, well, how profitable are our projects? You know, what's our utilization like? How good are we, how effective are we at managing our resources to staff these projects, not just right now, but for the ones that are going to take place into the future? If you're a wholesale distributor, you'll have a dashboard which might have a different set of real-time information that you're going after. You know, what is the status of our inventory management? You know, how are we doing with purchasing? How profitable are our different items? You know, all the different areas of their processes, whether it's financials, a sales pipeline, customer support, HR, spread about across the different regions. They all fit on a system so that you and everyone else in the organization can have the custom single view of the metrics that matter to you no matter what industry or business you're in. And when I say real-time information, it also has to be real-time all the time, especially when there's change. You take an acquisition, for example. When you have a cloud-based system, a corporate controller can go into the system, open a new subsidiary in the system, and then immediately you'll have your chart of accounts, your processes, and your customizations from day one. You can set up the system and it's immediately available. And then how about this for a process in real time? Think about cash collections. You know, if you have a business where you want to make daily cash collections at the end of the month, how can you do this if your data isn't real time? So with real time visibility, anyone can focus on the analysis and decision making more effectively. The fourth thing I want to share with you as you think about uh, levers for success as finance leaders, think about mobility. Because when it comes to the cloud, it fits with our priorities and it fits with our work-life balance. We want to know now. We are very real-time data oriented. You know, there's this culture of availability that everyone can experience. 
And then we also want to be mobile, especially if you're a distributed organization with distributed processes. So and imagine a distributed process that starts in Sydney where a transaction is created. And then the document has to move to the United States for approval. And then from there, it needs to move to the Philippines for some kind of provisioning or some kind of billing. And then the document moves back to California for some kind of uh, review or final audit. Anyone or everyone can pick up the transaction and put it back into the system, which essentially simulates what it would be like if you had people physically sitting side by side next to each other processing work. And then when it comes to mobility, we also want to self-serve. You know, services business now, they can track and report time quickly and accurately using just a mobile device. They can submit expense reimbursements by taking a picture of their receipt and just submitting it from anywhere. Rather than waiting until the end of the week to try and remember how you spent your time on money on Monday and Tuesday, work productively while you're on the go so you can concentrate more on the client service side of uh, things instead of focusing a lot on project administration. And then finally, the fifth thing that I want to share with you as you think about uh, drivers for success and levers for success, you know, think about how the cloud can help improve the economics of IT. Because with a cloud technology, you essentially subscribe to a service that is a very professionally IT organizational service across time and money to deploy. It's not only cheaper in terms of hardware and software, but also practical and possible to deploy and to finish the project. So for example, imagine a traditional ERP project that starts out at headquarters in the United States, and then it moves on to London. And then by the time you get to Sydney, it doesn't seem worth the time, and you have multiple systems as a result. Meanwhile, back at headquarters, they're doing an upgrade, and then suddenly it no longer even seems to be worth the effort anymore. And so you end up with dozens of subsidiaries for which it was never worth the trouble to roll out a single system across the organization. But with the cloud, it's cheap enough that you'll actually do it and finish it. Your upgrades are provided for you as a service, and your customizations always care for it. Your existing IT resources are able to dedicate more time to doing value-add activities. So as we've mentioned, we've now moved on to the panel discussion portion of the session. And I'd like to ask each of our panelists, uh, Michael and Yvonne, to spend a few moments to share some background about themselves and their companies. So going from left to right on your screen, uh, Mike, why don't you first tell us something about Harmony Information Systems, Boop? Yeah, good afternoon. Um, I'm Mike Bourne, I'm the CFO of Harmony. We basically help states um, deliver long-term care solutions. So that helps the state manage the aging, intellectual disabilities, or physical disability populations of the state. Um, we're trying to keep people, we help states manage their populations by trying to keep people out of more, out of nursing homes and keep them in more community-based living or in their own homes for longer periods of time. We've been around since 1998. We've, uh, we are a merger of two companies. And we've seen a lot, we've, as those challenges we saw there, we've lived through all of those, I believe. Mergers, tough times, and uh, short staff. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Yvonne, uh, your turn, please. Sure. Uh, thanks, thanks, everyone, so far. And uh, I represent SmugMug. We are a photo sharing service. We're based out of Mountain View, California, here in Silicon Valley. Uh, our premise is that uh, if you want to have um, a premium solution to store your photos online, um, we, we give you that solution. Essentially, it's photo sharing in the cloud. We work uh, both with the consumer uh, customers, uh, just your regular uh, family uh, who uh, want to share their photos online with grandma and grandpa, uh, or people who travel and they want to put their photos online. Uh, to, we also work with professional photographers. Uh, those are the people that want to have a portfolio site for their photos to display to their clients. Uh, they want to have a, a place to share the client galleries with their clients, as well as if they want to sell prints. Uh, we offer them e-commerce solution, a shopping cart for their photos. So it's a premium um, photo sharing service. We were founded in 2002, uh, one of the first such services um, ever online. 2002, as you may recall, is uh, before digital photography became mainstream. So uh, we started uh, working uh, when people were just starting to scan their photos and uh, put them online. And the company grew as the technology became more accepted, as the internet got faster, as uh, people started shooting more photos. Uh, now our, our storage is expanding drastically. As people buy more cameras, they buy more higher megapixel cameras and so forth. And so started as a, a company founded by dad and his son. 
and uh, eventually grew to uh, over 100 employees right now. Uh, some of them are here in our uh, Silicon Valley headquarters, and then we have about the other half of our employees who work uh, remotely from home in, in various states, uh, engineers and customer support. And uh, we work with uh, millions of customers uh, that uh, have joined our service or used our service over time. Great. Thank you, Ivan. Okay, so the first question I'd like to pose to both of you uh, has to do with challenges and pains. What were some of the challenges your company was facing? And uh, Mike, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so um, so Harmony was actually uh, has seen some pretty dramatic growth over time, as you know, as you see the population of the, of the Americas growing and aging out, um, which has created some other challenges. We've also went from a perpetual model. Um, back in our early days to more of a SaaS solution today. So we have customers both on perpetual maintenance, on a term licenses, and on a pure SaaS solution. We also acquired a company in 2007. The company we acquired actually had been an early NetSuite uh, customer. They bought NetSuite in 2004 to handle their customer care management tools. And, uh, and it expanded from the case management tools all the way up to finance when we acquired them. The parent company at that time was using uh, QuickBooks for their accounting system and was using open air to manage uh, complex projects. Um, so we needed a consolidated reporting package. We're in different locations around, uh, around the country, and we needed to look at something we could consolidate the whole workflow of the company. So we moved to a complete solution of uh, NetSuite. And, it's done, um, and then we've uh, done a really good job of handling our complex revenue recognition uh, methodologies and projecting um, future invoicing. Uh, we moved um, everything to one system, and now we also run on One World since 2010. Great. Interesting. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Ivan, uh, how about you, please? Um, can you please share with us some of the challenges your company was facing? Yeah, when I joined uh, SmogMug, uh, I became um, first finance officer, so to speak, that uh, worked at SmogMug, and uh, uh, they've had uh, one of the family members that was doing the books for all these years since the company existed, and um, but we've outgrown uh, that capability. We need more, uh, more serious uh, finance operations where we think about strategy, we think about um, revenue policies, and so forth. As we, as we get bigger, as our revenue is growing, and um, the the need became to 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 get more serious about it. And um, we were on QuickBooks at the time, and uh, it was. We have our grown ability to use QuickBooks. We started running into limitations in their software. We started running into uh, the problem uh, with the fact that only one person at a time could use uh, QuickBooks. And um, we needed uh, multi-user access uh, in a cloud environment. Um, we use um, Mac computers, so Windows servers uh, was not practical for us. And uh, our team, our finance team, uh, that is uh, right now three people, was spread in different locations. So it became hard to manage all that data, and um, also a record, re record retention became uh, a problem that we needed to solve, uh, not just on the uh, core finance accounting function, but uh, in things like uh, tax, in things like HR, in um, um, other areas of the company like planning, for example. And um, we wanted to get uh, better organized, and so we looked into various solutions as to um, what do we do to uh, make sure everything is streamlined and in one place and is accessible. And that's when we uh, came across uh, NetSuite as as one of the uh, one of the solutions. Terrific, thank you, Ivan. Okay, the next question I'd like to ask you both um, is if you can talk a little bit about um, the the decision making process, uh, whether you were with the organizations or not. Uh, if you weren't with the organization, you know what you learned about it after you joined. But in terms of the decision making process to determine. Uh, how you identified the solution for your needs, given that um, you know it's not just technology that's available to you, but uh, there's you know like I said earlier, you could work longer hours, or maybe you could just add resources. So, uh, can we talk about how you came to identify the solution you're looking for? Uh, Mike, would you like to take that one, please? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So, first of all, you know the big timing was when we merged the two companies together. So we had you know diverse systems, and so we were looking at best of breed. So what was be the best of breed for our company. 
Um, and we were also looking for a complete solution, not just a finance package, just not case manager, not just project manager. We were looking for a single source of um, service that we could do all things through for all of our needs across the organization. Um, so we just need to be able to enable it anywhere, you know, any employee get into it. So today we actually have all of our employees have NetSuite access and uh, use it, on, most of them use it on a daily basis. The second thing we're looking at is we were a SaaS provider or transitioning to a SaaS provider. So we understood and we were very comfortable with moving to the cloud and moving to a SaaS solution because we understood the benefits of having someone else manage your IT infrastructure for you. Especially for us, we were moving our company to a SaaS solution. So our IT people were really focused on our customers. And so keeping them focused on what's important for us as a company is, you know, uptime, you know, SLAs. We saw NetSuite when we looked at their things, we're like, wow, this is what we need to be doing. Um, it really set a great framework for us and allowed our IT team to really focus on our end users. The other thing that NetSuite offered was our customers log in to our case management tools and they can see what the status of their claim, customer claim ticket on and what their issues they're having. They can always look into the portal that we give them access to and see what's going on with their, their concerns and issues and we really like that. Terrific. So yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, Yvonne, uh, how about yourself? Uh, how could you uh, describe the decision-making process and how you identified the solution you're looking for? Yeah, we uh, we looked at several. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the key ones was uh, we wanted to have our system in the cloud, and we also wanted to make sure that it scales uh, as our revenue grows and as we get um, uh, more compliant with the gap. We wanted to make sure that uh, it was going to be easy to make changes and to uh, add functionality to our system. Uh, we also wanted to um, have a very easy to use interface um, that uh, was important to us because other people outside of the finance department wanted to have access to financial information, particularly our CEO and the company's president uh, wanted to, um, uh, to, to have a quick outlook into how we're doing in terms of our um, income, in terms of our cash and so forth. And um, we also looked into uh, what else is available out there that would feed into the system. So I mentioned HR. Uh, that was uh, we got to a point where we have 100 employees, and they're all on various review cycles. We needed a good, to have a good record system. And um, when we were evaluating NetSuite, it turned out that NetSuite is much more than uh, just an, another accounting system that uh, we could plug in and uh, various other information um, like HR. Um, and uh, uh, similar modules that are not strictly finance um, that uh, we could start keeping records. And uh, uh, so that became important because in the past, stuff was either recorded on someone's hard drive, uh, maybe contained in the email, or not recorded at all. And we wanted to start keeping good records as, as our company grew and as our employees started to get tenure. Uh, we we are, sort of outgrew the uh, uh, spreadsheet model. and. Um, Another thing that I was very uh, uh, started to get concerned about is the way we're recording revenue, because uh, we are a subscription-based business, and uh, so we were we had to comply with revenue recognition uh, policies around annual subscriptions and um, uh, different arrangements, and so we uh, looked into that as well. The nets we could handle uh, our complex revenue problem because we are. Um, not just uh, dealing with annual subscriptions, we're dealing with annual subscriptions from thousands of customers who use our service. Um, actually, hundreds of thousands of customers uh, who are renewing daily, who are canceling daily, changing their plans, and so forth. So it was impossible to manage that uh, in any other way unless it was automated, unless it was also speaking with our database um, that we've built over the years to record that information. Um, but uh, that translates that information into GAP. Um, gap compliant information and gap financial statements. So, um, so that helped us to uh, uh, when we when we nail it down. Uh, we also talked to some of our uh, peer companies, some of our friends in the, in the industry and here in the Silicon Valley, and uh, they've uh, we came to a decision to adapt NetSuite as as that system going forward for us. Thank you. That was very informative. The third question I'd like to ask you both. Um, moving to the cloud, uh, how would you describe the experience of uh, moving to a cloud-based system to, to go after some of the objectives that you wanted to achieve? Uh, Mike, would you please go first? 
Absolutely. So first of all, NetSuite is very reliable for SaaS delivery. It's uh, you know being a SaaS provider, it's the very seldom do you ever log on the NetSuite and just not get log right in. It's uh, it's amazing the 24/7 access. You know, a lot of people work strange hours in our company, so they need a password reset or they need to get access to the system. It's uh, you know it's, it's extremely highly reliable. I, I gotta believe the uptime is is you know, way above 99.9 percent .9 is the uptime reliability on the system. Um, and then the self-service empowers end users. I mean, right now, if you if somebody has a password reset, you know, you don't have to find an admin, you don't have to find somebody, you know, the IT person in the company. You can actually go in the NetSuite, reset your password, and you're up and running. And we know a lot of our executives in our companies tend to forget their passwords quite often or get their passwords confused. You know, this is really a great tool if you deal with your CEOs out there who seem to forget their passwords. You can they can actually go in now and reset their passwords without chasing down someone in the organization. The other thing that we've really found really helpful is we've sent some people not only from finance, from other departments, sales, customer support, to the to the annual user conference. And what they found out of those user conferences, not only they got great stuff out of the formal training about how we're not really using the full functionality of NetSuite and how we can be better using it internally. But they've also found tapping into other people who are attending it, saying, hey, this is what we're thinking about, what we'd love to do, and they find out someone else is actually doing it. And, and it's not that big a lift to get to what we're doing today to what we'd love to have. And so they've, they've come back every year even more excited about the product and uh, have come up with a lot of good implementation things that we've really got a big bang out of of attending those uh, user conferences. Splendid. Thank you, Mike. Okay, Yvonne, uh, could you please uh, share your experiences of what it was like uh, when uh, moving to the cloud? Yeah, it was actually a, a, a fairly easy experience for us. Uh, obviously, NetSuite is very uh, trained on transitioning people from QuickBooks to their platform, so uh, we had a good um, good uh, transition to that uh, where we were helped throughout the process by uh, their service team and um, it, it's been great uh, I often get questions uh, from our CEO who, uh, who who works near me who just walks into my office and asks me a question it could also be that we were just sitting in the cafeteria discussing an issue that came up and uh, uh, he would ask me uh, oh, how much are we spending on this uh, part of our business uh, I can easily quick quickly pull it up but the other day that just happened it was a very important decision making process and I just grabbed somebody's laptop uh, logged in into NetSuite and I gave them the answer right away rather than going leaving the meeting going back into my office to my computer putting up the system and so forth it was just going to be a really slow uh, process and I would never be able to, to, to find the answer quickly um, so uh, it's great when I'm on the road as well when I travel um, I can look things up on my phone um, or my tablet um, or even in the internet cafe have access to that and um, um, another another great thing is that in the past when we were uh, using just one copy of QuickBooks uh, I never had real access to my data I just had access to it in read only mode and if I had to make uh, journal entries uh, or adjusting entries for anything I had to um, uh, essentially just email a description of that to our uh, to our clerk and she would make the entries and and then I had to review them so it was a very uh, cumbersome and inefficient process whereas now I can go in and and uh, make changes make adjustments do reconciliations all by myself um, in real time um, without uh, without having um, have to uh, uh, to juggle several things and so it's it's been it's been a great process on top of that we uh, we are working on implementing revenue recognition module where revenue recognition will become automated um, uh, and uh, we've added several other functionalities like fixed asset management, um, HR system database and also a budgeting tool uh, which uh, which were great for for our planning uh, purposes. Wonderful. Thank you, Yvonne. Okay, and then the last question I'd like to ask the two of you um, when in, in terms of the benefits of it, uh, what's happened to you and your company since moving to the cloud? And if I can uh, bring up some of the things that I've mentioned early on about some of the kinds of distractions that finance leaders face and uh, you know, the benefits of having information that's readily available, uh, you know, can you speak to those aspects of it in terms of uh, what's happened to you and your company since moving to the cloud, please? Uh, Mike, would you uh, mind taking that one first, please? 
Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, moving the cloud, you know, clearly has gone through a lot of, you know, reporting issues and, and challenges going through, you know, consolidating two companies into one. We were also, when we consolidated two companies into one, we are venture backed. And so they went through a, a time where the financials actually got a lot more challenging after the merger. Things didn't quite work out what they thought. So the ability to get the whole company on one system allowed us to better understand where the revenue was coming from, where the expenses were on a minute by minute um, case. And also made it easy to generate all those last minute reports that we were getting from our investors. Um, we were also able to roll out the rev rec schedule so we can able to do projections in the future based on our SAS recurring model, how much was book of business was kind of already guaranteed of the revenue on, on the ongoing projections, and then layer in new deals. So it made it much easier to give those reports and provide the data um, within reports within NetSuite. Because a lot of times early on, we were actually doing a lot of this stuff in offline. So we dumped the data out of uh, NetSuite and QuickBooks into one system and then try to massage it in either Excel or F9. But you know, today, the, the tools within NetSuite are so strong, we, we very seldom do that anymore. We do almost all the reporting out of NetSuite, which makes it so much easier on generating those last minute requests from our CEO or our investors. That, that, that's awesome. Great. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, Yvonne, uh, how about yourself? Um, you know, can you speak to what you've experienced, what your company's experienced from having a system that could deal with some of those distractions that I mentioned earlier? Yeah, for us, uh, I'm, a, I'm a sort of a champion of waste and uh, a champion of savings of money inside my organization. And so uh, I can't go uh, to our marketing team, for example, and tell them, you guys need to cut down on hiring or spending if I'm not doing so myself. And so I, um, um, we, we are a growing company, so the, the hiring has to happen. But uh, it's easy for me to uh, control these things when I can say, well, look, I was able to invest more into software and be a lot more efficient than we used to be without ha hiring extra bodies, extra uh, human capital. Of course, there are times when you have to hire people, but uh, so far um, I was able to streamline finance operations and uh, cut our uh, closing times and, and do a lot of other things. Where in a normal situation, if we were using uh, spreadsheets and, and uh, QuickBooks, we'd have to hire extra people for this. I was able to avoid that. And uh, it was just uh, investing money into software, which is a uh, it's a lot savings on costs uh, because it's it's uh, it's easier to do, and b uh, it's a lot easier to scale um, one way or another uh, because sometimes um, you have downtime and you have uh, people who are not busy uh, with software. You just turn it off, or um, um, or uh, you know you turn off features, um, whereas it's hard to fire people. So for me, I was able to avoid that drama of dealing with it. And um, as far as uh, where we're going to be, um, like I mentioned, uh, we're working on the revenue recognition process. Um, I'm still uh, going to attempt not to hire any more people uh, this year, even though we are continually growing and expanding. Um, I hope to keep the headcount the same inside the finance organization. Um, and, and rather automate things and, and invest more into software, which is much more, um, much more cost-efficient method for us at this at this stage. Fantastic, thank you, Yvonne. Next question, um, I'd like to address address um, to Yvonne. Um, can you share with us um, how the role of finance um, might be changing at your company uh, in 2014? The role of finance is changing. Um, well, we're uh, playing a much bigger role now. Um, our um, founders are very uh, numbers driven. And uh, the board always likes to get information in the numbers. So we're starting to make a lot more decisions about the future of our product and the future of the company, as well as how we develop results based on the financial information we're getting. So we're getting a lot better at that. I'm, um, I've, um, I've been working on setting up uh, sort of KPIs for us to uh, work on and to, to track on a weekly and a monthly basis so we have a dashboard so so we can evaluate how we've done um, and uh, it, due, due to the nature of our business it's cyclical um, we uh, we want to make sure that uh, we account for that and so so these these are the some of the some of the things that, that we're working on okay great um thank you very much Ivan I'd like to ask you a little bit of a follow-up um you mentioned you know, working on um, KPIs, if you're willing, could you share 
um, a couple of, of those um, KPIs uh, with us and then just give us some color around um, if, if it actually was your move um, to the cloud that actually allowed you uh, to, to, to create the data and really track those KPIs effectively? Sure. Yeah, uh, one of the key things for us, uh, because we are bootstrapped, um, we're, not, we're not venture capital based. Uh, the company was started, like I said, by um, father and son. And uh, over time, uh, they just grew on retained earnings. Uh, there's been no outside investments. There's been no debt. And so uh, we're still bootstrapped, and uh, we want to remain this way. It's actually a nice, um, uh, the biggest advantage of staying in that position is that you have a complete freedom of what you want to do with the company. You, you don't have to deal with the board. You don't have to deal with um, outside investors who are, are always uh, want to sell, who always want to have an exit plan in mind. We don't have an exit. Uh, we're enjoying what we're doing, uh, working on the product. And so as such, uh, we have to very, keep very close eyes on our cash. So uh, a lot of our KPIs are around what happened to our cash balance uh, compared to last month. Um, are we uh, cash flow positive? Uh, what is the cash burn rate if we're not, and so forth. So uh, that's the key one. Once uh, once we know that our cash is growing, our cash reserves, um, I look at other things um, like uh, revenue and income um, on the weekly and on a monthly basis. We are uh, a seasonal business. Uh, we get uh, uh, half of our revenue comes from uh, it comes from commissions on print sales. Uh, people order print sales around Christmas time. They order them in the summer when they come back from their vacations. So I'm constantly having have to go back and adjust for seasonality of it. So uh, for me, uh, when I compare our sales, I always compare January to January, February to February, and so forth, because our sales cycles stay uh, very much the same. Um, and so I have to look at these things um, and evaluate them. I also look at the um, um, our, uh, our current liabilities versus um, versus our ability to meet them, yeah, having cash. Um, these types of things are, are important to us. So those are some of the key ones. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much, Ivan. Um, Mike, can I ask you um, the same question? And just repeat that. So, um, how how is the role of finance changing um, at your company in 2014, and and how have some of the the benefits of having that visibility? and increased collaborative capability um, going to help in 2014? Uh, yeah, so we see 2014 as a, as a threshold year for us. Cause, as again, we work with state and local counties managing their aging and intellectual disabilities. And with the Affordable Care Act now, um, from our standpoint, is actually a very favorable thing to us. So we see a big impact in our 14 model around um, uh, states expanding their um, needs and, and meeting the needs of uh, their consumers in the state that need uh, help. And one of the things we're doing is we've been historically priced on per users. And so we're looking at now changing that to per consumers served. So finance is very much involved in all the modeling, um, we're using different tools, and looking at going back and re negotiating contracts, switching from a per user uh, seat pricing to per consumers served. Because uh, we're trying to give our states and counties more flexibility to have more people using our application and, and really looking at the real solution we're trying to solve is what those consumers are trying to meet and, and meet their needs each and every day, like getting them fed, getting them bathed, um, getting them driven to the doctor's office, um, making sure the nurse comes and rides on them. So we're looking at how we serve those needs better in 2014. And finance is very much involved in looking at the pricing uh, trans transformation this year. Okay, great. Um, Mike, just a follow-up question. Can you share with us um, a few of the key KPIs um, that you use in your organization and, and, and how the cloud has maybe helped you on that front? Well, clearly, you know, cash for any company that's uh, a small in size is probably the number one thing you look at every day. And so, you know, online, you know, once you post the cash for the days or, or, um, is, is the key number. The second thing is we look at customer retention rates and how fast they're growing. So it's one thing we look at on a regular basis is what's our customer retention rate being a SaaS model. You know, are we growing it from organic growth? Are we getting new acquisitions? Are we getting it through um, upsells or price increases? And so we're constantly tracking that through the system. Okay, great. Mike, another kind of uh, follow-up question. You mentioned um, customer retention. Um, has your um, has your SaaS, can you speak to how your SaaS environment has maybe allowed you to collaborate um, better um, with your sales team and maybe visibility in the customer relationship management? Yeah, absolutely. Again, as we talked about earlier, we, we share the, share the uh, solution throughout the company. 
So everything from the sales reps to the customer success managers, like account managers, who are kind of managing the account relationship, to the customer support organization can log in at any time and see what the activity is on that customer. And so if a customer support has a customer call in saying, I'm having issues with logins or this report's not running, the customer uh, account manager or the sales rep on that account can also see that data and pull it up and be aware of what's going on instantaneously with the customer. And it doesn't have to be walking down the hall, you know, or, or what time of the day. Sales rep may be on the road. They can log in at night and see what's going on with that customer account. Okay, and it's hard great. to beat that. I mean, it's really hard to beat, you know, instantaneous updates on, on your existing customers. Great. Um, thank you very much. And in order to be mindful of our time here, um, I'm going to have to wind down the Q&A session. Um, any un unanswered questions we had during the webinar today, we'll get those uh, questions answered, uh, connect you with the speakers on that. Uh, some closing logistical comments. A uh, big thank you to Michael, Yvonne, and Ben for their time and insights. They're co thought leaders and an excellent source on today's topics. A note that in the post-webinar survey, you'll be prompted to take her after the webinar concludes. You have the opportunity to express your interest in being connected with today's speakers with just a few mouse clicks. Uh, again, a big thank you um, to our sponsor, uh, NetSuite. And just a quick note, um, registration for the second annual performative Performance Tech Conference is now open, and it's all about embracing the corporate finance technology revolution. You'll be asked in the post-event survey if you'd like to learn more information uh, about uh, Performance Tech. And finally, uh, a big thank you to the audience um, for your valuable time. We hope to see you again soon at another performative event or online at www.performative.com. Make the rest of your day great, everyone. Thank you very much.